So we've been interested in uh, implantable therapeutic devices to treat epilepsy through our collaboration with Graham Clark and uh, the Bionics Institute, now headed up with Rob Shepherd, and we've been very interested in how some of the materials and devices that they have might be transferred to our particular problem. So epilepsy is a really, really common problem, and most of you probably don't realise that. So 1%, conservatively, 1% of the population have epilepsy chronically. They're suffering recurrent seizures throughout their life. Probably 5 to 8% of the population have some seizures during their life. So it's a really common problem. And of those 60 million people worldwide with epilepsy, about two-thirds are adequately treated with currently available medications. We have an enormous number of people left over, obviously, with epilepsy. And what about surgery? So my early work was concerned chiefly with how surgical therapies might be applied and the advances in MR imaging. But even with these best of technologies, we're still left with 15 million people who aren't either suitable for surgery or can't access surgery, who are not adequately treated by medications. The medications carry their own special problems. We've got to ingest these medications that soak your whole body and brain, and your body doesn't like them. They cause bad side effects, or most particularly side effects on the central nervous system. They slow your mind. They affect your ability to perform. And as well, they have lots of other effects, potentially on the liver, bones, and other tissues. So they're not good drugs. Could we get them? to their target in a different way? Are there better ways that we could treat epilepsy? So these are sort of the questions which consumed us. Now one really interesting observation in the early days of epilepsy surgery, shown in this image from the 1950s by a fellow called Wilder Penfield, who was a, a, a revolutionary neurosurgeon who won the Nobel Prize for this work around mapping the brain. And he performed a lot of this work while he was doing epilepsy surgery putting in electrodes into awake humans' brains and stimulating the surface to find out what the effects were so that he could avoid removing areas which were performing important tasks like controlling speech or hand function. But during this process, they would stimulate brain and sometimes they would produce seizures and sometimes the patient would have a seizure during the procedure as shown here. So that, uh, that wriggly line is, is seizure activity developing under the electrodes that he has on the surface of the brain. This, this is an interesting one because the patient thinks of a problem and the problem that he's thinking about actually suppresses seizure activity, which is interesting. But that's not the point. The point's shown by the blue arrow where they're providing their standard stimulation to the surface of the brain and it suppresses the seizure activity. So this was very interesting and, and got a lot of people's attention. But of course, in the 1950s, the technology simply didn't exist to put electrodes permanently into people's brains, to maintain them, to have the processing power, to analyze the EEG patterns and provide counter-stimulation to suppress seizures. But it was still a fascinating detail. Now, we often implant electrodes temporarily in people's brains for exactly the same purposes. We're mapping the surface of their brain to ensure that we don't remove parts which are of critical importance. But also we can stimulate back through these very same electrodes when seizures are detected and try and suppress the seizure activity. And can we do that in humans? We can. So this is a lot of electrode recordings from one of these grids which have uh, a lot of electrode contact points and the blue arrow is indicating the point at which a seizure is developing and that large black bar is actually an artefact produced by our counter stimulation and you can see that abolishes the seizure activity. So you can do it, you can put these devices into humans, you can stimulate when a seizure is detected and all this can be done automatically and you can prevent seizures occurring. But there are some tremendous obstacles still to this. The contact between the electrodes and the brain and how to maintain that over very long periods, potentially the lifetime of a patient, how these are connected to the, the wires which join them to the boxes which are controlling detection elsewhere in the body, the transmission of the impulses externally to devices which analyse and give the information back to the patient. All these are an enormous challenge which we look to the Gordon Wallaces of the world and the peoples in the material sciences who can open up these unique opportunities for us. Now, a lot of the problem with epilepsy relates to its unpredictability. So one problem is that we have to soak people in medications to prevent seizures which might be occurring only for a few minutes a year, but in that few minutes disrupts their entire life, prevents them from driving, stops them working, threatens their safety, costs their life sometimes. So the unpredictability is a very major part of the disability. 
Their personal safety is at risk. They can't drive if they have seizures, which are uncontrolled. And it necessitates chronic drug administration for an intermittent problem. So we've been working with a group based in the United States around seizure prediction, and this has brought some really unique insights. This is a, a rendered x-ray film of, of someone who has one of these devices implanted. You can see a box which sits underneath their clavicle, a collarbone, which records information that's drawn from these electrodes that we've placed over their brain uh, through a hole that we've made in their skull. So this is chronically recorded. It's entirely implanted and it transmits information to a small pager-sized device which they hold and that has a series of lights on it. A blue light to indicate a very low risk of seizures, a white light a, a moderate risk and a, a red light a very high risk of seizures. Because this, if effective, would remove a lot of the disability from people with seizures. It might let them get to work, play sport, conceivably even drive. It might be that you can provide therapies when their status changes on the recording. And this is the outcome of this first in human study. The blue, the bars on the, uh, running horizontally represent 24-hour blocks, and the colours represent the stages of the lights. And you can see the, the lightning bolts, so the seizures actually occurring. You'll see in this, the best performer in this study, they're all occurring during periods where a seizure was predicted to occur. Not detected, but predicted to occur. And the intervals between the lightning bolts and the period where the red light comes on are periods between 30 minutes and 4 hours. So suddenly this changes everything. Conceivably, you could use devices like this to actually control the release of drugs. So we approached the material scientists. We saw, Gordon, we would like to put drugs where they work, not give them to the whole body, but put them where they work. We often know exactly where the seizures come from. Why not put the drug right there? So that's what we do. We put the drugs that we have in polymers, and we implant them at the moment in animals only, implant them into the animal over the surface of the brain in the part where the seizures come from to suppress seizures. This image, though, shows something even more sophisticated. These electrically activated polymers that we heard about in the last talk can actually be used to drive drug release. So the electric current put through the polymer can be used to drive the drug release. And in this example, we've used the seizure activity of this rat to drive the drug out. So the successive bottles there with uh, increasing redness are actually uh, a drug being driven out of the polymer by the rat's own seizure activity. Conceivably, we could construct polymer implants which could not only release the drug but detect the seizure and use the energy in the seizure itself to release the therapy. And this would be re remarkable. There are other therapies which have evolved over the, the years, some of which were thought to be quite crazy at the time. The image on your left is uh, from the 1950s. It's by an American neurosurgeon called Temple Fay, who created these large refrigeration devices, quite small for the time. Uh, that large refrigerator is connected to a structure which is embedded deep in this patient's brain. And he was using it at the time to treat a wide variety of neurosurgical conditions. Well, impractical, obviously. However, in recent times, the drive around microprocessor cooling has led to the development of structures which are small enough to implant in the brain, and several groups now around the world are developing devices to implant in the brain that cool the focus of seizure origin, and cooling this focus does actually suppress seizures, both in animal models and in humans, so it actually works. And you can do it without damaging the brain. But all of a sudden, because of these developments in materials, our ability to miniaturise these things, the possibility of putting sufficient processing power in a small device which is implanted entirely in the body suddenly becomes real. So direct electrical stimulation of the brain may well control seizures. It might liberate us of altogether of the need to take medications to treat epilepsy. There's the possibility, real now, that we can predict seizures. This is very early work, but it works. You can predict seizures in, in these patients who have chronic recurrent events, and you can predict them accurately. Suddenly, this opens new therapeutic opportunities. Could you harness these devices to systems of electrical stimulation to act before a seizure had occurred? Perhaps we could link them back to our drug delivery systems, the polymer-based drug delivery systems, and release drugs in anticipation of seizures developing, preventing 
the terrible burden that these events cause. So combined with these electrical and pharmacological therapies, there might be all sorts of new opportunities open. Maybe we could develop new drugs that are provided only when seizures are going to occur and are taken intermittently. But many novel strategies are being developed. I've only touched on some today. But devices such as cooling devices, other implantable devices which stimulate peripheral nerves around the body which send impulses back to the central nervous system to suppress seizure activity are well under development. It's a really exciting time. The innovations are incredible, the possibilities, phenomenal, and it's driven by these very, very dramatic changes, even in the last 10 years in material sciences, microprocessors, and materials. Thank you very much. <laughs>